I decided, no, I'd make it more like a track race because I'd had success in track races, training to surge in the middle, hold lead, and, and try to win the race that way. That moment comes in the race. Again, it opens up the way uh, you visualize it a little sooner than I thought. I thought there would be a point in that marathon where if there were a pack running along, that there would, they would kind of slow down, and then I would take off. Well, I'd actually trained to do that, just the same way I'd trained to run the 10,000 meters on the track. But I also knew I could probably run a single mile, maybe even faster than anybody in the marathon field had actually run recently as an open mile, because people just didn't train that way. They, didn't, they weren't track racers moving up. And so again, to, to look back and say, yeah, the plan was right. And uh, uh, is that luck? You know, is that planning the old thing? You, you make your own luck? Well, in a sense it was, but it's, it, it's everything coming together. The other thing I, I'm really satisfied about looking back uh, as an athlete is that I think uh, doing well in that race and, and the way I could train and compete in marathons, and even in 1976, four years later, um, I think if I had any ability in terms of training, for whatever reason, I was able to peak. I could pick a day when I should be on and I could peak on that particular day. I think for whatever reason, I, as an athlete, when I was emulating other athletes who were sort of my mentors in terms of you know, someone I would want to uh, run like, I also learned from perhaps their weaknesses. You know, and that, that's the competitor. You look for someone's strengths and their weaknesses. And so I think, uh, ironically, from Ron Clark, I learned, yeah, you can be in shape to set a world record, but you also have to be able to pick the day you're going to do it if you're going to do well in the Olympics. I remember coming through the English Garden, and we came to a 180-degree turn. For whatever reason, they, we were going in. It was literally in a garden on the grounds of this castle. And we went in and turned around. And as I went around the outside of the pack, I expected everybody to sort of accelerate back up to race pace. And nobody was really accelerating. So I started to accelerate just the way you normally do and I was in the lead. And I just thought to myself, okay, that's it. Here, here we go. This is where we're gonna find out. And I think that's, that's in a sense where the race is won. And there is a point where someone has to make a commitment and take control of the race. And I just decided, I said, okay, now I'm gonna find out. I've trained to do this. Uh, and I think, looking back, uh, what I'm proud of and satisfied with is that I didn't hesitate and it worked. And I'll also never forget the feeling. About 30 seconds into this surge, I turned around and I had a 50 meter lead and, and very quickly. And I was not surging that hard. And I thought to my, I, remember, I never forget, I get goosebumps when I think about it. And I got goosebumps then in the middle of the race. I thought to myself, they're making a big mistake. And so I said, that's it. We're gonna find out what goes on. And I figured that I ran that mile somewhere around 4.33. So in a sense, I went into tempo run pace to recover. And I knew that I could run fast enough if I had enough of a lead that I could really, even if they started to gain a little bit back on me, I could recover. In essence, I was doing interval training in the middle of the race. I mean, that's what you do. That's how these races are won, I think. It's, it's not the person who can run the fastest, it's the person who can run at that syncopated pace, and when it slows down to recover because everyone's run too fast for a certain period of time, and everyone's anaerobic, it's the athlete who recovers the most quickly at the fastest pace and then can go back into a race pace. That's the person who wins and that's how I train. I knew about the marathon course in Munich because I had run every step of it several times and I knew it was a marathon course of many, many turns. I knew if I got far enough ahead, I would be out of sight. And so the goal was not so much to get a lead, but to get out of sight. The tactical goal in the middle of the Olympic marathon was to get everybody running for second place and just say, okay, he's, he's gone. 
It, it, it was just fortunate for me that my way of training and racing suited the Olympic marathon. And, and so I, I think that uh, really contributed to it. I felt three people were gonna have a good day because it, it, that's just the way it works. Not everybody has a great day, and unfortunately, you only have so many marathons. So again, the premium is placed on really being ready on that day. So my goal was to be one of those three. And to get back to the story in mid-race, once I made the surge and I knew how good I felt, I realized I was one of those three. I was having a good day. So again, it goes back to that how you, you mentally put yourself into that situation to mentally give yourself a chance. You see, and so uh, again, as I think back on that after 40 years, I go, I certainly wouldn't change anything. In order to make up 90 seconds in 30 minutes, they have to run 15 seconds a mile faster. And who is going to be able to run 445 pace for six miles at the end of the Olympic marathon? And so at that point, I could relax and go, all I have to do is focus on pace. I didn't have to worry about going too hard. I didn't have to worry about anybody catching me because all I had to focus on was maintaining that effort, that perceived effort, which was producing that pace. And I knew I was going to be okay. So I hit the track. I make a right-hand turn. I'm waiting for the roar. It's silent. Absolutely, totally silent. Into the first turn, people started to whistle. And that, in Europe, is booing. So I was thinking, okay, what's going on here? But, it, but again, I, I didn't have this feeling like it had to do with me. I just figured something else was going on. And then, coming down the back stretch, someone you know, in, from the stands yells out. The guy had, I'll never forget, it was kind of a Midwestern Chicago accent. He, 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 he yells out, don't worry, Frank. And I thought to myself, why should I worry? I'm winning. When I had about 200 meters to go, and then went down the straightaway again, no cheers or anything, went through the finish line, and then right away someone came up to me and said, what'd you think about that guy? In English, and I knew. I knew immediately what had happened. Absolutely. It's, it, it's never bothered me, and you never know how you're gonna react in those kinds of situations, but I know because I was there, I now know that I never ran for that cheer. You know, that cheer wasn't part of the fantasy, it wasn't part of the visualization, it wasn't really part of uh, anything. Because thinking back on it right now, and I'd never really thought about it, back, in all the visualizations of the race that I had beforehand, none of it ever included the roar to the winner on the track. <laughs>